G'day there, Craig. Yeah, good to be with you, Chris. Now, when you think about how we got out of the Second World War and the things that were created, it yes. seems quite amazing. And it, it took probably a decade and a bit to get mm. some of the things that I mentioned moving and revenue building for the country. Mm. We need a plan of this magnitude coming out of this, do we not? Well, Chris, the key thing about when you look back through our history, the expenditure that was undertaken was actually productive expenditure. It enabled us as a nation to produce more. And ultimately, that's what we have to do at this stage. Because remember, you know, people like to go talk about stimulus. Every single dollar of stimulus money is borrowed that we've got to pay it back. Mm. So we've got to make sure these projects, infrastructure projects that we are building and investing in have a proper return to the nation and are just not sort of like, uh, you know, sort of feel-good programs. Look, if you want to do, Chris, you could solve unemployment by you know, getting people to dig very big holes in the middle of the desert with very small shovels. Yes. But that doesn't create, help the productivity of the nation. Yeah. And ultimately, we've got to look at these projects that will drive the productivity of the nation, that will make us more productive. And I think the biggest one, Chris, is we've got to get energy costs down. Mm. And I hear people running around saying, oh, we should have this renewables recovery. If you ever, you know, we should spend all this money on uh, importing solar panels from China. Well, that might help the Chinese economy, but it won't do a lot for the Australian economy. And look, I'd love to have the biggest battery in the world through improved technology to be able to store renewable power and create baseload power. But you just have to ask the boss of Shell in the world and he'll tell you that won't happen for no. probably two decades, he estimates. So put that aside. Mm. Let's, let's rub the whiteboard and make it white again. Let's get the texture. Baseload power. Where do we get baseload power from apart from gas? <laughs> well, there's a little thing, that little black rock that's called uh, coal. You could use that. There's another thing you've got called uh, nuclear, but, Chris, reality is if we start on that tomorrow, it's going to be a fairly long way down the track. The problem that we've got in this nation is we've got the Liddell coal Fire power station uh, up uh, north of Newcastle. We've got the possibility of that closing down very shortly. Now, that's 1.6 uh, gigawatts. To put that in some comparison, there was a report out of China yesterday. They are currently having, under construction and under planning, 250 gigawatts. So, it's the 250 gigawatts. Liddell is 1.6. And we're yet to organise the replacement of that 1.6. That has got to be a priority. You can't do it with wind and solar and batteries. That is a delusion. It is a dangerous delusion. And that would send this country backwards if that was undertaken. So what about high, highly efficient, low emissions, mm. coal-fired power stations... Some of the most populous countries in the world mm. are moving ahead in big leaps and bounds on that score. Mm. Well, that's right, Chris. So you say uh, 250 gigawatts uh, under construction uh, and under planning in China today, uh, and here we've got nothing under construction or nothing under planning, and yet, Chris, we've got the risk of these coal-fired power stations closing down, and that's going to drive uh, electricity prices up. It's not just about building a coal-fired power station for the sake of it. Yes, that would create employment as well. But it's about getting the cost of energy down. Mm. It's about taking advantage of what is Australia's natural competitive advantage, and that is that beautiful black coal seam that runs down our eastern seaboard. How do you convince the global climate change warriors that this is the way to go? Well, Chris, tell me what country in the world that has gone down the track of... Uh, filling their grid full of uh, intermittent generation of wind and solar that's delivered them cheap energy. Mm. Absolutely none. You've also got the uh, costs of, if you go down that track of wind and solar, you've got the cost of spending billions of dollars, unnecessary cost of billions of dollars, for new transmission lines, mm. which again, Chris, won't give us anything extra and will actually send us backwards in the long term. OK, water. There's a lot of waterfalls in this country. I know we're renowned around the world as having the most fearsome, fearsome droughts, but mm -hmm. a lot of water falls in this country. How do we better harvest it and well, make it affordably harvested? Well, Chris, I remember one of uh, the Gillard government's uh, senior advisers not that long ago said that uh, even the rain that falls won't fill our dams. Mm -hmm. We've seen what a complete nonsense that was and how dangerous and stupid that I ideology has become. Look, Chris, there's a lot more we can do in dams. I know my uh, cousins in the uh, LNP up in Queensland i have got a lot of plans on the drawing board. It's the north up there that we can get a, a lot of rainfall in Australia. And, Chris, this idea that our rainfall is going backwards is a complete nonsense. If you look at the data, we've actually had plenty of rainfall across this country. It just comes intermittently. 
And that's why dams have got to be one of our number one priorities. Yeah, we've got to build some dams and, and, pr and protect ourselves for when it does uh, fall into drought. Do we need to remove taxes at a state and territory level? Do we need to try and find taxes that incentivise employers, mm. unlike payroll tax, with decentivises employers for hiring people? Which ultimately, it's got to be the private sector that gets us out of this recession. It's got to be people prepared to put their own capital on the line and to take risks. And the more taxes you have, the more red tape you have, the more disincentive you have for that risk-taking and the greater disincentive you have for job creation. Obviously, one of the key priorities, we've got to continue to remove that red tape. When you see some of the uh, environmental processes that some of these projects have to go through and delay them, not years, but decades... In some cases, that is just an absurdity. That has to stop. We've got to make sure that people... We've got to give them encouragement and incentive to put their capital on the line and to make sure that they've got a chance of a fair return. What about, finally, immigration? Uh, after World War II, we opened the door. Could we not say to people, hey, we're putting the bar up higher, we want skilled immigrants, we want you to come here, these are the incentives, come and fill our country up, and then all of that revenue falls into our coffers? Well, Chris, sometimes in the past we've relied on uh, immigration as a bit of a Ponzi scheme to drive uh, economic growth. This is why we've got to be very careful and selective uh, with our immigration. There's, you know, we're one of the greatest countries in the world. People from all over the world want to migrate here. Uh, we need to be very careful on the migrants that we select, making sure that they can make a valuable contribution to the economy. And if you look at that's what Peter Dutton is actually putting in place with a lot of our policies now, Chris. All right. Good to chat. Good to have you on the program, Craig Kelly. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Thanks, Chris. All right, Craig Kelly, Liberal MP. So...